Alright, last year this is great. Oh boy, we're gonna have to back up and Yeah, I think she said she was going to get to it. Alright, you guys don't mind, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm sure you all want to get out of here on time. I know I want to get you guys out on time. So we'll go ahead and get started. Alright, so um, what we're going to be talking to you about today is profiles of underachieving gifted students. And so my name is Todd Stanley, I'm the Gifted Services Coordinator at Pickerington Local Schools. Um, and what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is, uh, this is all from my book, uh, When Smart Kids Underachieve in School. So the strategies I'm going to talk about, the profiles, everything that you see today can be found in that book. So uh, this is just kind of a lesson from that book. Okay. So, and that's from Proof um, So, first off, I'm going to set the stage. So I want you to be aware of how much of a problem underachievement really is, okay? So there is speculation that there's anywhere from 10 to 50% of gifted students suffer from underachievement. And you may be saying, that's a big, it's a wide gap. Why is there, that's kind of a big thing. And the reason why is there is no test for underachievement. You can't give a kid a test. You can't say, oh, you're an underachiever. You can't like take like and take a blood sample and, and identify them as underachievers. So and some underachievers can be really sneaky in that you don't under, you don't see that they're underachieving. So this is your student that sits in your class and gets A's in your class, but they're not trying that hard or they're not pushing themselves to that next level. So those people kind of mask the underachievement. Um, out of those underachievers about a uh, 25% of females could be considered underachieving, while 50% of males. So you can see it's predominantly a bigger problem amongst boys um, for various reasons, which we'll talk about. Uh, this one, when I saw this statistic, I was alarmed. 18 to 25% of all high school dropouts have been identified and gifted. That means one out of every four high school dropouts is gifted. So here is a student that can achieve at a very high level, has high potential, and yet they can't even graduate high school. So we know it's not their, it's, we know it's not their ability that's holding them back. We know it's not their lack of content knowledge or their ability to learn. There's something else that's holding them back. And so we're gonna talk about that today. All right, so, it, so um, the information I'm gonna share with you was done by a study in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, where they looked, they followed a cohort of gifted students out of school, into college, and even 10 years down the road in life, okay? And here are some of the things that they found out. 100% um, of the high achieving students went on to a four year college. Now high achieving means it's a little bit different than higher ability. So high achieving is a kid who works really hard. You have a lot of these in your, your classrooms, I'm sure. They're kids who aren't necessarily gifted, but they work really hard. They have grit, they have tenacity, they have the, the skills that we want all of our kids to possess. Um, and they're able to use that to get good grades and to be successful in life. Um, only eight, so they identified another pool of underachieving gifted kids and only 85% of those kids moved on to college, okay? So that's not terribly bad, um, the 80, eight, I'm sorry, 87% moved on, um, however, once they got into college, that's where it became an issue. So out of this high achieving students, 83% of them graduated. That's not a bad ratio. So you know, have a lot of high school dropouts for whatever reason. Um, and so 83 is not too bad. Amongst the underachievers, over half did not graduate from college. So even if they're getting to college, so we're, we're getting them out of the high school, we're pushing them on to college and bigger and better things. College is so much better, they have so much more choice, they have, they're still having those issues. The underachievement doesn't end when they go to college. Um, it carries on with them. But because underachievement is a habit, it's something that's learned. And so that's, how they, that's what they've learned. So the long-term effects, I thought this was really interesting. So 13 years after high school, they went back to this underachievement group. And they tended to find that they did not have stability in their careers. 
and even their marriages, um, then the high, the high achievers have much more what you consider successful careers, much more successful marriages uh, than these underachievers. So it, it bled over into their, into their real life. It wasn't just academics. This underachievement follows them. Um, and a lot of these underachievers still display these characteristics, such as low self-concept, low perception of abilities, lack of persistence, and the ability to accept responsibility for their actions. And so what I want you to see here is that underachievement's not just something that happens in school. Uh, underachievement is something that can carry on. And so this is why I feel it's really important to try to catch underachievement early and to try to you know, get, uh, get students so that they're achieving at what their, their potential is, um, which can be a tricky thing with gifted kids. So, first things first, I should, probably should have done this at the beginning, but irregardless, what the heck is underachievement, okay? So again, there's no like tests that we can give or you know, state tests or standardized tests or whatever. Underachievement basically is a discrepancy between their potential and what they actually achieve. So in other words, if you have a gifted math student in your math class and they're getting a C, is that match their potential? Probably not. If that student's gifted in math, more than likely they can get a B or an A. So it's not matching their potential. So that could be a possible underachiever. Um, underachievement as a discrepancy between predicted achievement and their actual achievement. So again, where do you think this, the student has, I mean we have years and years of data on our students. So from that data, where do we think they're going to perform and where do they actually perform? Um, and this can show up on like, on like the air tests and things like that where a kid has done you know, well for several, several years and all of a sudden they, they fall off the cliff for some reason. The last is underachievement as a failure to develop or to use potential. So again, what this looks like is a student who is gifted uh, across the board in multiple areas. And yet when they go to high school, they take all easy classes. They're not taking AP or CCP or honors classes. They're just in, they're playing the game of school uh, where they're just there to get the grade that they need to graduate and they are not there to learn necessarily. So what are some signs of underachievement? Um, like I said, taking easier classes can be a definite one. Um, so students who aren't willing to challenge themselves um, they avoid competitive academic activities. So these are kids who are really bright, but they don't do the in the know. They don't do the destination imagination or the model UN. And why? Because these students are afraid of failure. And why are they afraid of failure? The reason why they're afraid of failure is when you tell a gifted kid from first grade on, you're gifted, and this is, and we expect you to be gifted. That's what they, they're hearing from people. May not be exactly what's said to them, but it's what they're hearing. And they're used to getting everything right, and they're being the person, the go-to person to have the answer. And then all of a sudden, the content starts to get a little bit more difficult, and the classes start to get a little more difficult. And all of a sudden, they don't have all the answers. And so a lot of these underachieving gifted kids are afraid to fail. And so because they're afraid to fail, they don't even try. Because they can't fail if they, they don't try. So um, that happens with a lot of underachievers. Um, they refuse to try anything that might lead to failure or rejection, like I just said. Um, even something as moot as auditioning for the school play, because they don't want to fail. Uh, they procrastinate to the last second. So this is, my daughter is excellent at this. She like waits to the last, like she had an essay due at midnight yesterday. And so what she did was she, uh, she worked, she got home from work around eight, ate dinner, played Wii for two hours with her sister, determined what's the exact amount of time I'll need to do this essay and still be able to get it in on time. And so then about 10 o'clock, she broke what she was doing, worked on the essay for an hour, and then turned it in. So not the best way to handle things. And you know, I sat there and watched it and I, and I tried to tell her, but you know, that she is a junior in high school. Um, but these are those kids who like to outsmart school. I mean, keep in mind, by sheer definition, they're smart. And outsmarting school is something that they, they take great pride in. Um, for instance, getting all A's in an AP English class by not reading the material would be an example of outsmarting the system. Okay. 
They avoid opportunities to challenge themselves. When a teacher tries to push them, they just kind of give up, or they just don't want to give anymore. Um, and they give minimal responses to assignments. You, you all have these gifted kids, and especially in your language arts classes, they will give you the bare minimum answer that they can possibly give you. Um, because they don't see the purpose in having the long-winded, detailed answer, even though that is showing what they know. They just want to, do, want to get in and get out their efficiency experts. So, how do we find underachievers and what do we do about them? So I want you to think of yourself as a doctor. Basically, underachievement is a disease, so to speak. And you need to look for the signs of underachievement and then diagnose. And what you have to do when you're diagnosing is not only that they are underachievers, but more importantly is what is the cause of the underachievement. Because that can be, you can, you're going to approach that very, very differently. Um, so if you have a student that is, and we'll talk about several of the, the <coughs> 10 most common um, factors when it comes to achievement. So, but you're going to handle them somewhat differently. Now, you will have a student that maybe has three or four of these uh, causes of underachievement. So it's not just one. So, um, so, but as but the reason why we need teachers such as yourselves to do this is again, there's not a test the school to give can give that catches this. The only thing that's going to catch underachievement is your observations and conversations with kids and seeing what their potential is and seeing what they're actually giving you and then making that diagnosis. So that's where it has to happen on the front lines. It has to happen with the teachers, knowing their students and being willing to try to help them with their underachievement. So what, we're, what you're gonna do, um, I put a pile of a profile on your table, and I'm sorry I didn't run enough copies, uh, I put four on each table at least, so you may have to share, so hopefully everyone's a good share. Um, and what I would like you to do for the next five minutes is, I, and, this, and I'm going to be the teacher here, doesn't involve talking, okay? So what I want you to do is to read the profile, take about five minutes to read it over, shot, but underline anything that kind of sticks out to you, make any notes in the margins that you want to. But again, you're not having the conversation yet. I promise you, I will let you have the conversation. But for right now, I'm just going to ask you, do we want to be respectful to people that maybe need peace and quiet to read or to process? <laughs> so let's, let's not start conversations until we get to that point. You go ahead and take your five minutes right now, please. So I can see it. I think everybody's going. And if you're on an outside and you want to move to a table, you can do that. I do have a, just a couple more extra copies. Thank you. You hired two three. You're just reading this over, trying to determine. <laughs> What might be causing the students underachievement? <laughs> really understand who you'll be getting next year. If she doesn't question Now remember, this is not a conversation. You're just looking at yourself. I'll give you a chance, I swear. I'll give you the chance to talk. I know you want to talk. I will give you that chance. Right now, I just want you to process. That's all I want you to do for yourself.
we all looking at the same profile? Uh, Give you guys about another minute. And eventually what I want you to do to, is to diagnose your profile. So what is the cause of the underachievement in your particular profile? But I'll give you some choices before you get to that point. And I can say, we'll discuss these. So before I get started on the causes, the one thing I do want to point out, make sure it's clear, is that underachievement affects kids of all ages. We see it manifests itself more so in high school students just because they've been doing years and years and years of it. But it can start as early as kindergarten. Kids can come in and because you, you know you probably have those kids, for those who can teach kindergarten, you have those kids who are so bright, but their, their impulses and their behavior problems and all those things really get in the way of them being able to, being able to perform at what they're able to perform at. So um, it can affect kids of all ages. Um, even adults. So, cause number one is boredom. Okay? So, basically what this looks like is somewhere, and I always find this interesting, somewhere in our school career, like, I have two daughters. So one is 16 and one is 10. And both daughters, when they first started going to school, they loved school. If there was a snow, you know, snow day, they were bummed because they needed to go to school. They came home, they told me about it, they were so excited to tell me about their day and what they had learned. And eventually what starts to happen, especially I saw with the 16 year old, is the older she gets, the more she gets, oh yeah, I hope we have a snow day today, or what'd you do today? Oh, nothing. And basically kids, aren't as eager and excited as about school as they once were. Even my 10-year-old, she's a fifth grader right now, she loves school, but she loves to have her snow day now. And so, and she, and I, I fear she'll probably get to that point where, just like most kids who are in high school, they would rather be somewhere else than school. A lot of the problem is boredom. Um, and this comes from students not being challenged. So if you're a gifted student, it takes eight repetitions for you to get something. It takes a typical student 16 repetition, repetitions to get something. So imagine you're that gifted kid and you're having to hear something you already know eight more times. That would be torture. So sometimes it's not being challenged. A lot of times, you know, we want to keep, I, I've talked with teachers who have told me this. Well, I, I want to keep, when I said you should differentiate, well, I can't have them doing different things or I can't have them you know, moving ahead of the class or anything. And I'm like, well, well why can't you? And so, uh, but a lot of times you have teachers that definitely want to keep everyone locked in step at the same part, even though we know their abilities are much different. We have some kids who are going slow, some kids who are going really fast, and some kids in the middle. And I know when I was in the classroom at first, what I started to do is I just tossed to the middle. And I expected the slow kids to catch up, 
and I expected the fast kids to slow down. And this is not this is not just in your typical classroom. This can be in a gifted classroom. So keep in mind, if a kid gets in your gifted classroom because they have a 126 cognitive score, and there's somebody that has a 140 cognitive score, there is a huge difference between those students and their ability. So keep in mind, it's not just regular classes that we do that. Sometimes we, we, don't, differentiate, we don't differentiate enough in gifted classrooms sometimes. So uh, teachers who have mis misinterpret behavior issues for boredom. So that kid that acts out, why does he act out? He got his work done early, and he's bored, and they're kids. So they want to do something that is not going, that is going to entertain them, and it may not be what you want them to do. So um, again, you have to have, you have to have things in place that uh, prevent that from happening. So, but when kids get bored, they start to underachieve. So what are some things that you can do? So one thing you might think about doing is doing a pre-assessment. So I did this in my science class when I taught fifth grade science. I would give kids a pre-assessment, and we get pre-assessments all the time, by the way, but a lot of people don't do anything with them. Like, for instance, kid will do a pre-assessment, they get a 100%, and I'm like, oh, so you let them skip it, right? And they're like, no, I made them do the unit with everyone else. But they've already shown you they know it. Why do you, are you making them do that? So what I would do in my science class, I would give a pre-assessment. If they got a 90% or higher, I gave them a grade, a, a in the grade book for that unit, and then let them work on an independent study. And what I, what I found, and I didn't mean for this to happen, but what I found was these kids who worked on the independent study projects worked far harder on those than they did the things they were actually getting grades for. The independent study was not for a grade. I did not like give them extra credit, or but they were passionate about it. It was something they really wanted to do or something they wanted to look into. I had this one kid, I never forget, Doug. He tested out every unit but one. And he was really into ornithology. He loved birds for whatever reason. And so every project he did was something to do with birds. So he looked at the evolution of birds from dinosaurs. He looked at the different flight structures of birds. So he did all this. I learned more about birds that year than I ever hoped to learn in my entire life. So, but irregardless, Doug, and by the way, Doug is now working at the Columbus Zoo, so um, so it did pay off for him. So um, project-based learning, I I really espouse project-based learning in my classroom. Towards the end, I taught for 18 years in the classroom before I moved to administration. My classroom was completely project-based learning, and the reason why is because what I found was when I wanted kids to learn content, they would memorize it long enough to take the test, and then they forget about it like a week later. And so I figured I'm wasting my time, I'm wasting their time. How do we get this enduring understanding of this long-term learning? And what I found, so kids would come back like five, six years later, and they'd come visit me and they'd say, Mr. Stanley, you know, remember when we did this? And it was always a project that we did. That I, just, I just did them intermittently at times. I didn't do them all the time. But every time a kid came back and talked to me, they were like, oh, Mr. Stanley, I remember when we did this project, and da 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 It was always centered on a project. I'm like, this is what's sticking. This is what they were remembering. Okay, and so I started doing projects full time in the classroom. And what I was starting to see is kids were starting to get a better and during understanding. And it showed up in air, the air results. And people are like, we have to drill and kill on these air tests. You don't. Um, you know, if you teach them, you know, if you teach them something that sticks, that's going to be much more effective than teaching them something for a really long time that they, they don't learn. The last one is an alternative assessment. So a lot of times we give pencil to paper tests. And so that can be very boring. Not only for the student, it can be boring for you as the teacher. And you have to grade 150 of them. And they're all the same. And they're all the same answers. So alternative assessments like performance assessments. So for, you know when they're giving presentations or exhibitions or they're creating models, or they're doing things like that. That can be exciting for students. It allows them to be creative. And it allows them to use the skills that they have um, in, in to be able to create this assessment. All right, second cause, social emotional needs. And this is one we hear a lot in gifted, social emotional needs. So what does that mean? So kids are very, gifted kids especially, have overexcitabilities. 
Not all gifted kids, but a lot of them do. A lot of them can be really impulsive. You know, they want to share the answer with you. They're really excited to do that. So they shout out the answer. And they're so excited. What are they told? You didn't raise your hand. Be quiet. So they're not being disrespectful. Some of them are, by the way. But a lot of them are not. A lot of them just want to share what they know. Because we, anyone who's worked with gifted kids, especially in the lower ages, we know they're know-it-alls. They want to show how much they know. They want to prove how smart they are. And so we got so they have low frustration tolerance, lack of impulse control. They're not willing to take risks because, again, I talked about that failure. Um, in addition, gifted kids, and, and for better or for worse, a lot of gifted kids do not suffer fools gladly. In other words, if you put them in a group with kids who they deem not as worthy as them, they're not going to do the work or they're going to shut down, or they're not going to be a productive member because these people are idiots. Why would I want to work with them? So they're not saying that. Sometimes they're saying that, but a lot of times they're thinking that. Okay. So some strategies. Allowing the, the students to challenge the teacher. I got into this habit of um, I would give students something, and I would always make a grammatical mistake, spelling, punctuation, something or other. And the challenge was always to find that mistake. I wanted them to point out my mistakes because they were doing it anyways. So we might as well make it productive. So, um, so that I would hand something out and they would go, ooh, ooh, ooh you, you forgot this or whatever. And so I was allowing them to challenge me. When we would do class debates, I would partake in the debates so that a kid was scurrying off against me in a debate so they could challenge me directly. But you want to give them opportunities to challenge the teacher on your terms rather than challenging the teacher on their terms when it's not so good and they're challenging your authority. So um, I'm not suggesting that you let them run over your classroom. What I'm suggesting is that you give them a chance in a productive way to challenge the teacher. Advisory groups. We do this. Um, I, I teach or I um, coordinate a gifted magnet program in Pickerington and we have advisory groups every other week. So they sit or, uh, and they sit down and they talk about what, what are things that are bothering them? What are things that are issues? What are things that they're seeing? Because kids will give, if you give them a space, boy, they'll give you their opinion. So, um, but giving them the opportunity to do this was important. Uh, I even created a, I just, I even bought a suggestion box. Put it outside my office and kids can come and put suggestions in there. I get the most interesting suggestions from those. Um, and so, uh, but giving them voice. Um, Activities that encourage risk taking. So, when kids, we know when you take a risk, that's where the greatest learning takes place. If you're really comfortable with what you're learning, you're actually probably not learning very much. It's when you're being challenged and you're taking a risk. And so, we need to create classrooms that are safe for them to take those risks. So, that means they can make mistakes. The new fail now is first attempt in learning. And I love that because what it means is kids can make a mistake and it's not gonna cost them. You're gonna give them a chance. So like we do a lot of reworking, at the middle school and down, and the high school teacher's like, how can you let them rework? They're not learning how to do it right the first time. And I'm like, yeah, but at the same time, they can't make any mistakes in your classroom. So they're not gonna take risks, they're not gonna try. I would rather a kid try and fail miserably if they're gonna learn something from them. Third cause, peers, so other kids. Um, Delisle talks about the difference between peer mates and age mates. The difference is gifted kids intellectually are usually at an older age than kids their own age. But in the United States, for whatever reason, when a kid turns five or six, they enter into kindergarten. And then they go to first grade. And they, and they go with all the kids that are the same age as them. We know as teachers, those kids are not all the same. There are kids that could be maybe in your first grade class that could be in a third grade class. Or there's a kid in your third grade class that should be in your first grade class. So, for whatever reason, we set it up like that, and so as a result, they have trouble finding peers. They find kids who are their age mates, but not their peer mates. And so, what, you'll notice this kid because they'll come up and talk to you. Because you're the one who they consider their peer. And so I always had these kids that would come up during recess and they'd be talking to me. And I'm like, why are you talking to me? They have all their friends here. And I realized it was because they were craving a conversation that was more so than what their age mates were providing. Um, 
getting made fun of for doing well. This is why underachievement is worse in boys, I think, than girls, because it's acceptable for girls to be smart in a lot of ways. Uh, boys, though, you're supposed to be what? Athletic. You're supposed to be the jock. And so if you're not, if you're doing well in school, then they're going to make fun of you. And they, research has shown that especially in uh, African-American students, this happens quite a bit, where, people, where, where males are made fun of for doing well in school. And so as a result, they don't do well in school because they want to fit in. Because everyone, whether they want to admit it or not, wants to fit in. Um, sometimes they feel bad because they're smarter than their peers. You think kids have a lot of empathy. So when they get something really easy and other people are struggling, they don't want their classmates to feel bad necessarily. So they may play dumb. Strategies here, magnet programs, putting kids with peer and age mates alike. And so, like I said, we have a gifted program, magnet program, where we pull kids from all over the district into one building. And the thing that parents say in the fall conferences more than anything else is, my kid finally has a friend. Or my kid finally has people over to the house to play. Because they have these peer mates that match the age mate as well. Could be cluster groups. So putting, if you can't do a magnet program, magnet programs can be kind of expensive, but you cluster all the kids together. They have each other to be peer mates. And then of course there's acceleration. So if a kid is in seventh grade, in seventh grade, but they can handle ninth grade math, you put them in the ninth grade and they can have a conversation. Now sometimes, of course, you want to be careful. You may not want them having that ninth grade conversation quite yet. So it can be a little tricky. Um, but you know, they do, they do, you know, sometimes turn to older students to find those pyramids. Home life. Now, we all know this is not something you can control. And I'm not suggesting you go into someone's house and tell them how to raise their child or to adopt kids, okay? But, but you should be made aware of these. So for instance, you may have parents that don't value education. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing necessarily. They may have had a bad experience when they were in school. And as a result, they, they just don't see the value in, in a good education. Um, and it's not something they're being malicious about, it's just that they were never raised that way. I know, um, you know my children who, um, my wife and I both went to college, and so we, we value education to a certain extent, and so our kids know when they get older, they're just going to college, that's just the way it is. They don't even question it. We don't say, you must go to college, it just, that's the expectation. So that's what they, my brother and his wife, neither of which is a uh, college graduate, their kids, none of them have been to, to college because it just was not in the, it was not the expectation. And there's nothing wrong with not going to college, by the way. But, you know, we, we saw if you wanted to have greater opportunities down the road, then you would need a college diploma to do that. Uh, parents could have too high an expectation. So this happens in gifted kids sometimes where the parents is it, are expecting too much. They put so much pressure on their kid. How many people in here have gotten a call from a parent because their kid got an A minus? And I'm like, really? It's an A, first off, it's fifth grade. Secondly, it's an A minus. They still did pretty darn good. Um, but for some odd reason, they think that A minus is gonna prevent their child from getting into Harvard down the road. Uh, so, but this is a parent who has such high expectations that nothing else is, it matters. And, you know, I want to make fun of these parents, but every once in a while, I'm one of these parents. So my daughter will bring home a report card from high school, and it'll be all A's and one B. And do I say, hey, great, you got five A's. No, I say to her, why the B? And so I'm just as guilty. You, you can fall into that very easily. Home dynamics. So sometimes, depending on the, the life that the kid is living at their home, so it could be they're helping raise their siblings, or it's a single parent family. Or their parents are, you know, they're living with grandparents because parents are unable to raise them. So home dynamics can cause kids to be underachievers because when you send homework home, they don't have a place to do their homework. They don't have means to do that. So understanding this home life situation, you can't do anything to change anything about their home life, but you can, you can change the way that you react to a student who has these issues. So if you have a kid who can't do homework when he goes home because there's just too much going on, provide a space for them to do their homework. Provide a, ch a chance for them to come in maybe during recess or something like that and do work on their homework then. So, um, but giving them opportunities that they don't have at home. Strategies here, 
before or after school enrichment. So, um, you know, having like, I have a gaming club that I run at one of our um, social or economically disadvantaged schools. And these kids come in and I'm like, oh, we're gonna play Scrabble. Everyone here has played Scrabble, right? Like, no one had played Scrabble. And I was like shocked. I'm like, oh, you know, and, and, you know, why haven't you guys played these games? But what, what I found is that some, some people, you know, value games such as that, some families don't. And so what these kids were, they were just loving this gaming club because they were playing games they had, that seemed common to me, but they had never played. Um, and so having a place for them to go either before or after school where their value, where their intelligence is looked upon as being a positive thing can be really important. Parent education seminars. So what I mean by this is not calling up parents and telling them how to raise their kids. That would be a big mistake. What it is, is just informing parents of, this might be something you might want to consider, but this may be something, you know, have you thought about this? Or reading an article and having them discern from it what they, they got from it. So I, I uh, run a parent meeting every month in my district. Um, sometimes I get two people, and sometimes I get 50 people. Um, but irregardless, you know, we're talking about things that, that, they, you know, that matters to them or that can help them to work with their gifted child. Field trips. This is another thing. Um, studies have shown that kids who have outside learning experiences provided by their parents tend to do better at school. So if you take your kid to the zoo, or you take your kid to the science, science center, or you take them to the art museum, those kids, when they first start school, have an advantage over kids who don't have those experiences. Um, and, so, and so what they found was kids could catch back up during the school year but eventually what happened is that gap, there's a little gap the first year, a bigger gap the second, and pretty soon that gap becomes so big that a kid who doesn't have those experiences can't overcome that gap. And so it's providing, can you provide field trips from by the school? Or, you know, I've run field trips on Saturdays, right, taking kids to things because, you know, they, they may not have that opportunity otherwise. And so providing things like that. And I know that sounds like a headache, you have to get the buses and all that stuff, but, you know, uh, kids really, really do enjoy doing these field trips, and it values education. Cause number five, they're twice exceptional, are two E students. So this is a student with a learning disability. Um, could be a attention deficit disorder, could be hyperactivity. Um, strategies for working with the students, and I know there was a good session here on two E earlier today, but just some minor, some, some basic things is, uh, teach students how to set realistic short-term goals. A lot of times with kids who have learning disabilities or hyperactivity, they can't see the big picture. So you have to scaffold, you have to break it down um, and help them to, to see, do this first and then do this and then do this. Because what happens is you give them this big lesson to do and they become overwhelmed because it's too big a task. So breaking it down for them a little more. Um, Visual and tactile kinesthetic formats for learning success. So rather than learning about math by writing it on the board, having manipulatives that they can use to do their math or things of that nature where they're being tactile, they're being able to, um, and more visual approaches. So when you tell someone something, and this is awful because I'm talking at you for an hour, but studies show that when you talk to someone, they hear 10% of what you're hearing. Um, even people who are trying to listen. Um, so less verbal instruction, more visual, you know, um, so basically looking at all types of learning. Specific instruction and organizational techniques. Give the kids in general are poorly organized. You know, if you ask them to pull a paper out of their book bag, they, their book bag, first off, weighs like 50 pounds, and it's jammed, they make them pull like a permission slip from the first day of school, and it's like, you know, May. So they keep everything. So. Sitting down with kids and helping them to be organized in organizational techniques, um, even graphic organizers to help organize their thoughts can be very helpful. But just helping put into place the organization of kids. And this, I'm not talking about like first and second graders. I see this at the high school level. Um, but you know, I get that gifted kid. It's like, oh, well, your book bag's really heavy. Why is it so heavy? Well, I've got five books in it. Like, well, why do you have five books? Well, I have the book I'm reading. I have my backup book and have the backup book I have in case I finish that one too. And so just like, you, know, you can put those in your locker and not have to worry about carrying those around. Cause number six, lack of intrinsic motivation. 
So that's the fancy word of what we often say is lazy. So a kid is lazy. We sometimes label that um, unfair. So what typically happens is they're not lazy, but they do what's called goal valuation. So what that means is there's how important a task is, how interesting a task is, and how attainable a task is. If you have all three of those, you're golden. The kid thinks it's important, they find it interesting, they think they can attain it, they're gonna nail it. However, if you have a kid who doesn't think it's very interesting, then it's gonna devalue the other ones. Or if the kid thinks, I can't do that, that's impossible, then if they don't think it's attainable, again, it's gonna affect the other ones. And so these three have to work together for kids to see the, especially the older they get, to see the, the purpose of doing what they're doing. You know, you always have that kid, why are we doing this? Okay, that person is um, challenging that, that task is important. So you just have to convince them that it is important. Um, they're not willing to play the game in school. Listen, everyone in here knows school is a game. And there are kids that play the game to much success, um, and they do very well in school. They're your compliant kids. They're your kids that are following directions, are eager to please, so on and so forth. Some kids just aren't willing to do that. Some kids aren't willing to play the game in school. So I, I, mean, I can't tell how many times like a kid has said to me, this is stupid. And you say, well, you're gonna have to do it anyways. Okay, and so rather than saying that, I should try to find out why they think it's stupid and to show them the value in it. But because this kid's not willing to play the game in school. You have to find the proper carrot. This, and what I mean by this is, it's always amazing that kids who get really bad grades, we think we're gonna encourage them by giving them even more bad grades. So we're like, oh, well, they've got an F already, we'll just give them, we'll, we'll, we'll make them, we'll, if they get another F, you know. And they don't, that kid always doesn't care. That kid's getting an F, he doesn't care about grades. And yet if you put that as the carrot, they know if you don't do this, you're gonna get a bad grade. They don't care. You know, they've shown that they don't care. So you have to find the proper carrot. There was this kid, he's, this, he's a third grader at one of our elementary buildings. He's always misbehaving, always doing the wrong thing, always causing problems. And the carrot we found is we gave him 15 minutes to do what he wanted to with a bunch of materials that we put in a box. And this kid was golden. That was his carrot. He earned that every day from, from doing his work. And so he would do his work just to get that 15 minutes. That was his carrot. So each, every kid has their own carrot and you have to find out what that is. Do you have any so, suggestions for finding that carrot? Yes, again, so for this particular kid, we noticed he was very hands-on. So we wanted to find hands-on things. But you know, it will come in the, in the conversations that you have with students and what you see with students. You can even ask them. And there's nothing wrong with asking a kid what do you think, why do you think you should use or why aren't you doing this? So, I mean, yeah, don't be afraid to ask them. So strategies for that, that lazy kid or that lacks intrinsic motivation is independent research projects. Giving kids a chance to work on something by themselves that they're passionate about. Um, I've done passion projects in the classroom before and I'm always amazed at the work that they do uh, because it's something they care about. Um, mentorships. So um, getting another adult to show them the value because this person is in the real world doing what, what they do and they can show them the value of this. Uh, passion projects like I talked about. Independent research projects and passion projects sometimes overlap, but a lot of times, you know, independent research project can be a kid finishes their work early. The last thing you want to do is give that kid more work. But when you offer something like, hey, you can learn about anything you want to learn, because let's be honest, all gifted kids love to learn. Every single one of them. They don't always want to learn what you want them to learn, though. And they don't always want to learn what school wants them to learn. And so you got to find what it is that they do want to learn. And so if that kid wants to research the, um, the progression of ACDC songs over their career, you know, by all means, let them do that. And, you know, and let them feed their, their, their learning, their love of learning. Cause number seven, lack of skills. And you definitely see this later on. So these are answers come easily to give to kids in their younger years, and the older they get, teachers just assume they have these strategies. So if you have ninth graders come in, you're like, they know how to write an essay. How many ninth grade teachers do we have in here? Do we have any? Do they know how to write an essay? Yeah, yeah, that's what, yeah, yeah. So we, sometimes we assume they have certain skills. Don't assume. So um, 
And the reason why we, we focus in, in traditional schools, we focus on memorization and not 21st century skills. And so what we should be focusing more on these 21st century skills. So for instance, test taking skills. How do you take a test? It is huge to know how to take a test. My 10 year old daughter went to Montessori school up until fourth grade. She never took a test all those years she was in Montessori school. She came into uh, Pickerington local schools. She took her first star test and she was in fourth grade. She tested as a second grade reading level. And the teacher's like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm really concerned about this, da 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 I want to put her on the watch list. Um, and then, so then my daughter took the winter star test and had, had had some practice taking tests. She was at the sixth grade level of reading, mm -hmm. okay? Just because she didn't know how to take the test and learning, and so that it wasn't the content that was tripping her up. It was the format of the test. Uh, Note-taking skills. If you can teach a kid how to take good notes, I start with my third graders, by the way, on how to take good notes. If you can teach them that, boy, they're gonna be really successful at later on because they'll be using that skill for the rest of their lives, even as adults. Teaching them research skills. What does it mean to make a Google search? What does it mean to not, and I, you know, I always find this interesting. Uh, English teachers say, absolutely, you cannot use Wikipedia for one of your sources. And I always tell the teachers, you can the kids, you can absolutely use Wikipedia as a source. Just make sure you check the sources and you check down at the bottom so they're, they're evaluating whether that is a credible source or not. Because um, I would rather than, I'd rather than learn that skill than just avoid something altogether. Because there are some good Wikipedia articles. Cause number eight, lack of programming or trained teachers. So there might not be gifted programming in the district. There might not be proper gifted programming. So if you have a bunch of kids who are ELA gifted and yet you're offering math, then those kids aren't getting their, their needs met. Uh, teachers may not have the skills to teach gifted students. We know that teachers have strengths. Like for instance, I could not work with special education students. I'm telling you right now, I would not last, I wouldn't have lasted a year had I had to teach special education students because I'm always like, come on, why can't you get it? It's right there. I do that with my 10-year-old daughter all the time. Okay? So, however, I do find myself having a lot of success with gifted students because I feel like I can I can I'm good at questioning and I'm pretty good about challenging them to the next level and things of that nature. So there are people that are very good at gifted that can't do special ed very well, and people who are very good at special ed but maybe struggle with the gifted because they're not asking those higher level questions. And so you want to match the proper teacher up. So I, as much as possible, I try to recruit teachers into my gifted programming. Um, and so I go to the principal and say, who's really good at moving high kids? And then I go have conversations and then invite them to do that. Strategies, having learning centers. So in this case, um, even though if you can't have a gifted program, you can have um, learning centers where kids are, where they're differentiated and kids can learn at different levels. Differentiation in general. Differentiation is one of those things like we kind of slap a band-aid on and say differentiation will solve everything. But knowing how to do it properly takes a lot of work. Um, it's not easy to do. So but keep in mind you should be differentiating in gifted classrooms as well. Student is teacher. So, not having your kids tutor kids, by the way, who are not getting it, that's painful for them. However, if you give students the opportunity to teach the class a lesson, you know, they're going to remember it more so, they're going to be more involved, and they're going to do a much better job than you will sometimes. I had, I had this group that gave a, a uh, presentation on the um, Boston Massacre, and I was blown away. It was like a college dissertation. They, they, they point out things I'd never even considered. I've been teaching history for 15 years. So sometimes that will really blow your mind. Cause number nine, not being challenged. So the solution often is to give kids more work. They finish their work early, let's just give them more. They finish their 25 problems, let's give them 25 more. That is not the solution. The work should be different that you're giving them. Give them five really challenging questions rather than 25 questions that are not challenging. Um, you have to use Bloom's taxonomy to make it more challenging. You know, you have to ask those evaluation, um, synthesis, or uh, sorry, creating and analysis questions as much as possible. Look at your assessments, see how much you're asking those. A lack of differentiation can cause a lack of no challenge. So gifted seminars are one, especially at the high school 
where you have kids where there's not much gifted programming. There can be gifted seminars where they're, they're having like a five, and we have like an E&I period, which is like an enrichment and intervention period. And so I run some gifted seminars where we do youth and government and things like that. Um, high level questioning skills. For me, this is the backbone of any good gifted classroom, is teachers that are asking higher level questions consistently of their kids, uh, where kids just expect to have that. Four Corners Project. So what I had in my classroom, I had to get to classroom, kids would finish early. And what I would say is, okay, if you want to, I'm not making you, but if you want to, you can do one of the Four Corners Projects. And they were always something that was fun. It was educational, but it was still fun. And so um, one corner I just called the big box of crap corner. I put a bunch of crap in the box and let them build. So you know, you'll, get a, you'll get amazing, and again, I had kids work harder on these four corners projects that were not for a grade than their actual work. They would be working to get their school work done so they could get to the four corners project. Last one is being too smart for your own good. We know there are those people that are maybe too gifted. Um, and, so they, and so as a result, they get in their own way. Uh, they're obsessive compulsive disorder, perfectionism. Um, they're abstract thinkers that cannot translate to concrete answers. Um, and so strategies here is translating abstract to concrete. It's funny, we, we had a program that was fourth through eighth grade, so we had kids, we looped them for four years. And it's amazing, fourth and fifth graders don't get the concrete, that they abstract very much. And so getting them to get to that point, and something happens in the sixth grade and it just clicks. Um, I don't know what it is, but it does. Dealing with perfectionism. Um, and then showing them the long-term benefit of the lesson. So why are we doing this? Great question. Let me try to answer that. So let's look at, so does anyone want to gather from your, if you had profile one, does anyone want to tell me what they think the cause of underachievement was? Yes, sir. Boredom. Definitely. Boredom, not challenged. Okay? That student was not challenged. Profile number two. You want to take a guess at that one? Online. What's that? Online. Online. Definitely. Online. Profile number three. Twice. You're knocking this out. Twice exceptional. Yep. Profile number four. Whoop. Just gave it. Years. Sorry. And then profile number five was lacking intrinsic motivation. I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to whiz through this last part. The one thing I will say that I feel is most important in reversing the underachievement is what I call the caring factor. Um, if you show that you care about your student, or that, and I know that you, you all care about all your students, but if the student feels like they're cared for, that makes a huge difference, okay? So let me show you examples from the five profiles that you read. The five profiles that you read are real people, real famous people, actually. So profile number one was Albert, or it's, um, Albert Einstein. Okay. So the question is, he underachieved in school. How did he get? How did he get to become Albert Einstein? And how? There was a guy named Max Ptolemy who came to his had dinner with his folks and would bring him like science and philosophy books and really challenge you know really inspired him to do these things. For five years they interacted. If Max Ptolemy had not come to the Einstein family, I am positive Albert Einstein would not have been the person that he ended up being. But he found someone that cared. Profile number two, Eminem, the rapper, okay? Uh, he had horrible home life. You cannot, I mean, I know his stuff can be really crude and crass, but he's very talented with words. And so, who cared for him? He had a um, uncle that, I'm well, sorry, his mother's half-brother. He introduced him to rap by giving him soundtracks. They would do rap together. And this kind of inspired Eminem to, to give, you know, to, to go down that pursuit. But he had someone that cared. Even though his home life was crappy, there was someone that cared. Profile number three is Agatha Christie. I don't know if you guys know Agatha Christie had a learning disability. She had dysgraphia. She couldn't write her books. She actually um, spoke her books out loud and someone else typed them for her. Um, and so Agatha Christie um, was homeschooled her entire life. Um, she didn't get to interact with kids, except her mom decided to, to get her into a play. And it was this friendship she formed with the girls of this play that caused her to grow to love theater and to begin writing. And so she became who she was. 
Front line number four is Dylan Klebold. Dylan Klebold is one of the Columbine shooters. And he wrote in his journals that he felt no one cared for him, other than his parents and his close friends. He suffered from depression, suicidal thoughts. I often think, what if? What if there had been that person that showed that they cared? Would things have turned out better than what they turned out? Profile number five is Winston Churchill, the guy who didn't like authority, didn't like uh, the guy who became the leading authority in England. So Winston Churchill's parents neglected him. They were rich, they were well off, they left him to be raised by his nanny. It was his nanny that instilled in him the, um, the, the um, love of, uh, that he got for learning. So she's credited with instilling him the morals that guided him as leader of this country. Okay. So, I want you to remember one thing, if you remember anything from this presentation, is that children are not born underachievers. They learn it, just like they learn other things. So it can be unlearned as a result. If you catch it early, even if you, you have a kid who maybe has been you know, an underachiever for several years, but you are that caring person, that can make all the difference in the world. So. To wrap up, any questions about anything? Great, got that one down. Any concerns? Yep, yes, please. Are the profiles available like, on the. Yeah, I'll put them on, I'll give them to Ann so she can put them on the website. Absolutely, yes. Okay? So, here's what I'm going to throw out there, by the way. If you're interested in learning more about this and you would like a copy of the book, I will give you a PDF copy of this book. What what smart kids when smart kids under I should know that one book. When smart kids under achieving school. Here's here's what I need though in return a review on Amazon. It doesn't have to be a positive one. You can say this book sucks. And I'm okay with that. But reviews tend to drive sales, and so I you know I, I'm buying your review, not your good review. I'm buying your review. So, if you are interested, you can contact me at thegiftedguy at yahoo.com and request a PDF copy, and I will send that to you with instructions, and I'll even give you a few months to read it. So I don't expect you to do it tomorrow. You know, I'll, you know, I'll give you like a window, please have it on by this time, okay? So, thank you so much for coming today, and enjoy the rest of your day.